European Commission then decided to launch the, the Human Resources Strategy for Researcher and the Associated Award. Um, and initially, I think there was quite reluctance in the UK to, to be involved in this. And we fought fairly strongly with the Commission to get guarantees that it would not be linked to funding um, because of all the issues around the Commission making decisions on, on you know, who's got the award, what does it mean. Um, some countries immediately signed up for the award saying, yes, we're there, we're behind it, we're doing it. And it's like, how can you know you're, that's happening? So in the UK, we're actually very loath to sign something if we're not sure where we are in, in the whole position. So we sort of sat back for a whole year and didn't participate much. But then we decided that actually it could be a very useful mechanism for us in terms of the Concordat. So we've set up a UK process, which I'll tell you a little bit about as well. So for the, for the HR Excellence Award, we manage that within the UK. We do the assessments and evaluations for institutions, and we work with the Commission on that side. So this is sounding like a long history to me. I hope it's not sounding too long for you. Um, we're now, 2010, we got our, our first universities went through the ward. We launched another survey because what became apparent was in order to make progress in this area, you have to engage the hearts and minds of the principal investigators and the senior researchers. This can't be done at an institutional level or a researcher level. It's, it's, the, it's the principal investigators that influence the culture of an organization. So on our survey that we launched was one asking principal investigators and research leaders about their views and experiences of managing and supporting their staff. Again, quite a controversial move because there was um, Principal investigators are much more interested in their research than they were in the researchers, was the perception in terms of what was happening at the university. So we were very brave. Institutions have been very brave and asking PIs to tell us uh, what they think about this whole agenda. I'm going to skip to 2013 now because we're starting to see much more emphasis from the European Commission about the importance of professional development and career development for researchers. So within the Marie Curie actions, there is a, any, there's a requirement for any funding that involves the training of a researcher on a doctoral program or the employment of a researcher, you are required to have a career development plan for that individual. It's part of the conditions to apply for funding. Um, and we're hoping that it will be very much part of the evaluation process as well in terms of how well that funding was applied. Just last year, um, on the Horizon 2020, Article 32 was announced. Article 32 says in terms of a beneficiary of any Horizon 2020 funding must take all measures to implement the Charter and Code. It's the strongest language I've heard from the Commission in terms of the importance of the Charter and Code in your ability to attract and receive European funding. If that's not a very clear signal of the direction that the European Commission's going in, then you're not listening. Um, we look at the future. There's, there's, um, there's already a, a proposal to introduce accreditation as part of the HR Excellence Award. Um, that accreditation will be a much more robust system than the award is at the moment. So it's like, what does that mean in terms of the implications on institutions? And how long will it be before that accreditation is linked to future funding? If you ask the question to the Commission about will there be a direct link, will there be a requirement for having the HR Excellence Award for European funding, the answer you will get is generally not yet. So they're leaving the door firmly open that within Horizon 2020 we could see some, we could see some requirement in terms of wanting to see the HR Excellence Award and maybe even accreditation to be able to apply for future funding. Even now, there's an expectation that you will be uh, looking at the HR Excellence Award. It will be seen as a, a useful way in which you can demonstrate that you're supporting the careers of researchers in terms of your applications. So I think all the messages are there about how important this is going to be for future funding. 
So quickly in terms of our concordat, this is our translation of the charter and code into seven, six categories, but seven principles that uh, you cannot argue with. It's about making sure that you're having open and um, equal recruitment. It's about recognizing and valuing your staff. It's about supporting their career development because you have an obligation as an employer to support your staff. It's about ensuring that researchers understand their responsibilities within this process and that they're taking ownership for their own career development. It's about providing equality of opportunity for every individual you employ. And it's about monitoring and reviewing the effectiveness of the implementation of those principles so that you're continually improving. And we've made these specifically very simple and very unarguable in terms of institutions um, because it's the way you as an individual would want to be treated. So why aren't we treating everybody else in the organization in that way? And we've built our HR Excellence Award around this around these principles. So we have, we have European Commission acknowledgement that the Charter and Code, sorry, the Concordat is equivalent to the Charter and Code. Uh, we have our own HR Excellence in Research Panel, which is part of our Concordat Strategy Group, which is a very high level chaired by our ex-chief scientist. Um, so it has very high profile in the UK. We include a representation from the European Commission on the panel to ensure that we have that equality of, of process. Um, and they will, they take part, the panel looks at the first two stages, so the, the receiving of the award and the internal review of the awards, and they are reviewed by peers. So we have people that, that review the applications um, and, then, and then make the decision whether or not um, they will receive it. In terms of what VTI does, we manage the entire process. Um, we also act as a helpful assessor before people apply for it. So people can submit their applications to us in advance. We will provide feedback for them before it goes to the panel. And I think this has helped enormously in terms of the whole process. We will put them in touch with other institutions that have been through it so that they can learn about their experiences because I think that's a very powerful mechanism at the moment. And I'm sorry for the, the one institute that has the award. You could be getting quite a few phone calls, I hope, after this presentation because people, it will be useful to, for people to know how the process worked for you. We're in the process of developing our external review process um, because we have our first tranche of institutions coming up to the four-year review, which is an external peer review process, which we're using a combination of UK and European peer reviewers. Um, so this, this has got much more sort of a higher level of review, but we're trying not to make it any more burdensome than the previous stages of, of the process. And in fact, we're building it into our normal processes of reviewing the Concordat implementation. So as Lewis said, we have 80 UK organizations um, with the logos and a bit of one-upmanship in terms of your logos. There's 80 here in terms of the institutions that have gone forward to it. And from, I suppose the first question is, why are institutions doing this? I mean, clearly there's the threat of the European funding, but I don't think in the UK that's why people are doing it. Institutions are doing it because they want to produce excellent research. Primarily, this is about excellent researchers do excellent research. And the happier and the more content those excellent researchers are, the better their research will be. Um, so there, there is evidence that happier people do better work. So it's about how do we make sure that we have a workforce that are enjoying the work they're doing, excellent at the work they're doing, and therefore we get excellent research out of it. They want to be recognized as research intensive universities, so they want that international recognition. They want to recruit international researchers and the best researchers from all over the world. And they want to improve the abilities of the researchers they currently have. Nobody wants to employ a poor researcher. So how do we make them the best we can be? 
And then finally, it's, it's, it's a way of ensuring a flow of research funding into the organization as well. So the drivers, irrespective of what's going on externally, are really strong for institutions to engage in this. Um, and they have engaged quite wholeheartedly in terms of implementing the Concordat and, and now in getting the HR Excellence Award. But through the work that we've been doing, we have also want to make sure that those that may be wavering, saying, oh, I'm too busy to do this, there's other things going on, I'm not going to, that we make sure that this is integrated into other aspects of, of, how, of our research environment. So you may have heard that we have the Research Excellence Framework in the UK which is the way institutions are judged on their research performance by the government and the core funding is allocated to universities for research on this basis. So for the, for the 2013 assessment, the Research Excellence Framework assessment, institutions were required to submit information on their research environment. And part of their research environment was how do you support your doctoral candidates how do you support your postdoctoral researchers, your research staff? How do you support your academics, your senior academics, in terms of your human resources management and support for them? So it's become part of the funding that governments are allocating to, to research in, in universities. We, we, the, our research councils, who are the organizations, we have seven research councils in the UK, and they allocate funding for specific research projects and areas. They have it within their statement of expectations that, research, that institutions will be implementing the Concordat and supporting the career development of researchers. We have an initiative called the Athena Swan, which is about supporting women in science, which echoes many of the principles that we have in our Concordat. We have the VTI Researcher Development Framework, and there's a, quite a small picture of it there, but this, what we, we did with the Researcher Development Framework was identify the knowledge, attributes, and behaviors of successful researchers so that we could provide researchers with a mechanism to think about how do I become a better researcher. So researchers can self-reflect on, on this framework and institutions can think about their own provision in terms of training courses, mentoring activities, uh, ways in which they're building up the competencies of their researchers. So that's linked directly to the Concordat as well. Um, and then finally, um, institutions are very interested in how well they're doing. I've not been to an institution that's not highly competitive in terms of am I better than the people that I benchmark myself against. So part of this initiative and part of the work that VTI does is allow institutions to assess how well they're doing compared to what they think are, are their comparators. And I'm just going to talk briefly about the two surveys we do because I think you may find this quite interesting as well. So if we talk first about the cross survey, which is the ones we're talking to our we're asking our researchers. These surveys are run inside an institution and managed by an institution, but all of the results are, are aggregated onto a UK level. The advantage of doing it this way is that centrally, myself, the government, the funding councils, the research councils can only see the aggregate UK results. So we can see how well the UK system's doing. An individual institution can see their own results and they can see how that relates to the UK aggregate and also against benchmarking groups. So for example, an institution may say to me, compare, say to, look on the survey and say, compare my results to those of Oxford, Cambridge, Imperial U University College, London, because they're the ones that I'm competing against. So they'll be able to see how they compare without anybody else being able to see that confidential information. So it's a way of, of looking to see how you're performing without revealing any, any negative results that you may not want to show to anybody else. You can do longitudinal comparisons. We've now been running CROSS since 2002. Um, so you can, an institution can see how some of those key questions, are the key results are moving year on year. Um, and I said you can, as I said, you can got confidential benchmarking groups. So in 2013, we've just run the survey last year. We've got over 8,000 responses from that, 
representing about 26% of our research staff population. So very strong data in terms of understanding what's, what's underpinning the whole of the UK research system. And institutions are feeding back to us how valuable they find this in terms of thinking about their own operations and their policies inside their institution. Similar, pro similar process for PEARLS, as we call it, for principal investigators. This is asking them about their views of what research leadership means and the management of the researchers underneath their, their, their control. Again, we can do longitudinal comparisons. We had an even better response rate here. We've got 28% of our principal investigators, which completely shocked all the universities because we expected that principal investigators wouldn't want to engage in this. The results came out surprisingly high. After research outputs and, um, and, and raising funding, Developing the next generation of researchers was the most important thing that principal investigators thought was part of their role, um, which was much higher than everybody was expecting. Um, so there's a, there's a message here in terms of principal investigators are interested in this. They want to do something about it. But I'll show you a few slides that just shows there are some issues here that we need to work with them on. So taking our recognition and value principle, this is the hardest one. This is about how do you recognize the contributions that research staff give. Because in the UK, they're primarily employed to do research. But when you ask them what they actually do, they're doing a lot more than that. They're being involved in teaching, they're being involved in administration, they're being involved in public engagement, in, in commercialization of activities, in supervising doctoral candidates, in supervising undergraduate. The list is endless in terms of what they're doing, as well as trying to do the research that they've been employed, contracted specifically to work on. So it's about how do you recognize that in a system that barely acknowledges the broad level of activity they get involved in. So we ask some questions around, do you get an appraisal? Which is an absolute minimum in terms of human resources management, in my opinion. Everybody should have an opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation in terms of how well they're, they're performing in terms of their job, and how is that, as my employer, supporting my own career development? and what are, what are the actions we're going to do over the next year. So we ask whether they have appraisals. Um, we've still got a long way to go in terms of those appraisals being useful and, and not just a, a, a tick box exercise or something that they have to do because it's compulsory. We ask them whether or not they believe they're treated fairly in comparison to other staff, and that will be over a range of things in terms of whether they're treated fairly, fairly in terms of their teaching obligations, or their access to equipment, or their access to benefits or promotion opportunities. We ask them whether or not they feel they're recognized and valued in terms of their contributions. And I think this is the area where we have to work most hard in terms of doing that. And we ask them about their work-life balance. The thing that shocks the researchers themselves is knowing that principal investigators feel that they have a much worse work-life balance than the researchers, than the people on short-term contract. They have this vision that once they get into a, a, you know, a permanent or a long-term position as a lecturer or a professor, that they'll be in this nirvana that they've always sought for when actually the, the results coming out of the principal investigators survey shows that they're much less happy, feel less recognized, and less valued than the research staff themselves. So it's, it's quite an eye-opener for some of them in terms of, is this a career aspiration I continue to strive for? Because when I achieve it, I may be less happy than I am at the moment. So it's quite interesting how this, this survey is, is, you know, giving you an op gives us an opportunity to talk about career aspirations and, and whether people are thinking about what they're heading into before they head into that. Because we have an issue in the UK that the majority of our researchers want to be academics. And 60, 70 percent of them, that's their aspiration. Only about 10 percent are going to make it. So we have to deal with that mismanagement, that, that mismatch between aspirations and, 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 and reality. 
In fact, if you, it's, it's probably common across Europe. Eurodoc uh, did a survey of researchers across Europe and asked them what were their career aspirations. 80% of them said they wanted to be, um, have a career in academia. 80% of them thought it was highly unlikely that that, that would happen. But they, they're still aspiring to a career that they think is, is unlikely to happen. So I think we've got quite an issue here in terms of we're training more and more researchers who are coming through with aspirations for employment that is just not going to be there. We need to start looking much more broadly about how we employ our researchers. So we asked the PIs about how well equipped and confident they feel to do some of this line management human resources management that we're expecting our PIs to do. Coming through fairly confident, fairly confident in terms of their performance management and conducting appraisals, but when we look more detail at this, we ask them what do they think is important, very important, and where do they have high level of confidence in this. And you can see that the sort of people management roles are perceived as much less important than the leadership. So the actual hard graft of uh, performance of review, doing appraisals, encouraging researchers, moving them forward, they perceive that much less important than being the leader and showing the research excellence and, 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 and being a figurehead in, in terms of their research groups. They have the lowest level of confidence in terms of being able to provide career as advice, performance management, conducting appraisals, and, and managing finance. And I think this is starting to reveal where some of the issues are. If people are less confident in an area, they're less likely to engage in it. So they'll avoid doing it. So we need to look at how do we support our principal investigators in terms of talking to our researchers about their careers, um, their, their career development. And how do we help them to do effective and useful appraisals um, for their researchers? We ask them about the roles that they think are important and whether or not they believe they're recognized by their institution for doing those roles. So we, found that we have fairly high acknowledgement that some of these activities are important. So that's supervising uh, doctoral candidates, developing research staff, managing staff performance, budgeting finance, and appraisals. But in terms of whether or not they feel recognized by it, those percentages drop quite considerably. And we can see in the middle, the middle group, developing researchers, um, supporting research staff performance, about 30-35% of PIs are saying they're not feeling recognized at all for their contributions in this area. Um, to give you an example, only recently in the UK has the management, the supporting of doctoral research has been seen as a workload for, for, for supervisors. Previously, it's been seen as something you did in your spare time alongside your research. But now, institutions are recognizing that if you want to have good supervision of doctoral candidates, you actually have to give academics time to do that and acknowledge that there is an effort involved in it. And I think that's the way we need to look at in terms of you know, looking at workload models and how that balances with what the institution is trying to, to achieve. So, we've been doing this, uh, these surveys for quite a few years. What we found in 2013, what we found in, they only run biannually, by the way, that's where we've, we've um, that was, our next survey is going to be 2015. 2013 looked as, as if we're plateauing. We've seen improvement on improvement. We've seen steady increases in all of the key measures that we use. But in 2013, we thought we were plateauing. So we decided to look elsewhere and look what was happening across Europe in terms of the HR Excellence Award. Because every institution has to publish their action plan. So it's like, must be some really good data there in terms of what's going on, what, what are other institutions doing that we're not doing in the UK. Um, so we did an analysis of everybody's action plans across Europe. So that was, six, at the time, 61 UK award holders and 48 non-UK award holders. Um, we wanted to compare whether there's any differences in terms of the approach and looking at good practice. And also, whether or not, because we were coming up to the external review, 
is there a framework that would be useful in terms of consistently institutions are looking at these things and therefore there is a framework that we can build that would help us both evaluate ourselves internally as institutions but also use for the external review process uh, which has not been very clearly defined by the European Commission uh, in, in terms of how that's going to happen. So in terms of the finding coming out of this, resort, out of this report, um, significant evidence of, of implementation going on across Europe with those institutions with it. What's coming through very strongly that by engaging the HR Excellence Award has had ed added benefits for the institution, that it has driven policy and practice around um, human resources development, which institutions have found really beneficial. It's given them an opportunity to reflect on the way they do things and maybe think about doing something different. Uh, it is very similar across Europe, but there are some differences which I'll highlight in a minute. Um, and it's coming through quite strongly from the UK, the benefit of having these national mechanisms through the surveys and through VTI and the research and development framework. That that's one of the reasons why the UK has been so successful in, in getting so many institutions through, is that we have those mechanisms and sharing experience and, and, and good practice. Okay, so in terms of the, the principles, and you may find this useful if you're going through the process yourself of creating your action plan. Um, most commonly, people have reviewed their pay and reward processes. They've looked at their recruitment processes to see whether they're equitable and, and open. Um, they've looked at either developed from scratch, reviewed or revised their appraisal processes uh, will be the common ones around this area. And they've started to increase the number of jobs that are, are, are transparently advertised externally, um, mostly through the Your Access job site, um, website. But there are other things coming through as well about training people up to do, re to do interviews so that they're, they're, they're experienced. And that includes both central administration staff, but also PIs. If in many institutions in the UK, you cannot recruit a researcher as a principal investigator unless you've had research, uh, interview training. You certainly cannot, you cannot recruit somebody unless it's done through a panel interview and there's somebody other than the PI involved in that panel so that we're making sure that people are getting quality of opportunity. Uh, we're looking at uh, the level of recruitment, looking at things around diversity, also the use of fixed term contract to make sure whether or not that they're justifiable in terms of the situations because the fixed term regulations requires that you need to be able to prove a fixed term contract was, was appropriate and needed. And a couple of the UK institutions have been taken to court by researchers and who have won about the inappropriate use of fixed term contracts. So that's an area that UK institutions are quite sensitive about. Um, European, uni non, sorry, the rest of Europe uni universities are, are much more likely to focus on mobility because that doesn't feature quite very strongly in our Concordat where it's a very strong feature of the Charter and Code about encouraging mobility of researchers. Um, we're such a diverse and open system in the UK that our trouble is keeping people still rather than getting them to move around um, in terms of our population. And there's a strong message coming through about how do you translate powerful and useful policies into changing practices on the ground? Because you have to do that by changing the practices of individuals both researchers and those PIs. And that's quite challenging to be able to do that consistently across an institution. So support and career development. Most commonly people are offering career or professional development programs, um, providing access to careers advice and guidance. And I think this is an area that has previously been very neglected in terms of uh, researchers, particularly those on short-term contracts, having access to, to advice in terms of their career options. And given the issue around the ability to secure an academic position, I think we have an obligation to do that better with these researchers. 
um, induction into the institution, making sure that they understand the processes and the, the procedures as a, as a researcher. So other themes are around mentoring programs, which are becoming extremely popular in, in institutions. Helping PIs understand career development and how do you give career development advice. Nobody's expecting any PI to understand the career opportunities that are beyond their own knowledge base or discipline or, or, or academia. But we are expecting PIs to be able to help researchers to go and get advice where, you know, more professional advice from where they can access it. So it's about helping PIs to understand their role in this process of encouraging researchers to think about their career development. There's all a similar theme here in terms about how do you engage researchers. So researchers' responsibilities, this has a different meaning in the UK than it does in, in the Charter and Code, because in the Charter and Code, it's very much around making sure researchers understand the sort of ethics and the integrity that they have to do in order to be a good researcher. In the Concordat, we interpret it not just that, that's certainly a part of it, but it's also about that an individual is responsible for their own career development. It's about you cannot wait and expect the institution to take responsibility. You have to do it yourself. You have to drive your own future. The institution is there to support you, but the obligation is on the researcher. So some of the evidence coming through from this is that um, how do you help research staff take a wider role? How do you involve them in committees and the organization and the management and the teaching within an institution? Because they're going to have to be able to do all of that and probably have to evidence it to, in order to get the next position and along the academic career cycle. Other themes coming through is about helping create research staff associations giving researchers a voice within an institution, because that's very difficult. Most researchers are very focused on their own research, and to be able to, to get them to engage with an institution about how we can improve the conditions is quite difficult, and research staff associations are one way of doing that. And in the UK, we have a cascade model where they may have research staff at disciplinary level, institutional level, and we have an overarching association of research staff associations so we can start getting messages out to researchers directly on the ground. How do you get researchers to be able to experience things beyond um, the institution that they're working in? So how do you support collaborations placements in other institutions or in other sectors. And in the UK, we've started to develop programs which are placements for research staff to go and work in industry or in, 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 in other environments, so maybe public sector or in museums, depending on their discipline, so that they can experience the opportunities there are for them outside. Okay, quality and diversity. The most common is this is about monitoring equality and diversity. This is probably the least developed aspect of the Concordat uh, principles. There's a lot of monitoring going on. There are quite a few initiatives around um, supporting gender initiatives. There's much less in terms of looking at other characteristics of providing equality of opportunity. Our Equality Act in the UK requires institutions to monitor nine protected characteristics, which includes age, disability, um, sexual orientation, um, I can never remember them, remember them all, some of them, uh, religion, nationality, all of them, you have to demonstrate how you're giving equality of opportunity to, to people around those characteristics. And then finally, the implementation and review. The nice thing about the HR Excellence Award is it, it, it is continuous. Once you've got the award, you can't hang on to it unless you show that you're going through a cycle of regular review, increasing and improving your action plan, and moving forward. So every two years, you need to be able to demonstrate that you are, this agenda is still important to you and you are making progress. You can choose the extent of progress that you want to commit to. 
So it's very, it's very flexible in that way, but you do have to show that you're gradually getting better and you're moving forward in this. And institutions have had their awards taken away from them at the two-year review stage. They've had the proposal to the commission rejected. We've had a couple that have gone into, sorry, that's not good enough, you're gonna have to come back and, and redo it again in the next cycle of, of assessment. You need to make sure that you're uh, complying with legal uh, requirements within your country. And in some countries, that's quite difficult because some of the laws of the countries are conflicting with some of the aims of the Charter and Code in terms of what you're trying to do, and particularly around some of the sort of openness of recruitment. So you need to, make, to find ways and just how do you balance what you're legally required to do against some of the principles of the Charter and Code. Okay, I'll come back onto that. So in um, I'm going to leave you with this final slide. Well, I'm not going to leave you. So if some of you have questions, I'll stand up here and, and see if I can answer them. But the recommendations around this is this, this, the HR Excellence Award is generally a good idea. And it's not just, it's, even though it's the commission's idea, it's generally a good thing for institutions to do. You should be doing this anyway as a good employer. So we need to widen the uptake of this across Europe. We want to explore the evidence-based framework to see if that's something that will give institutions a very helpful way. And in fact, we're probably going to turn it into guidance and examples of good practice. So I the same way if we've looked at this report, it's like these are the things that people have most commonly done. And here's some examples of how different institutions have done it. So that you can give, give ideas to institutions about how they may want to think about doing it. Organizations should fully publish their plans. Um, and that's a very polite way of saying some of the plans published by institutions were less rigorous than others. Clearly, some institutions have taken this agenda more wholeheartedly than others. Um, and I would like to see the commission being a bit more robust in terms of what they will accept as an action plan. We need to look at the areas where we need more improvement on. And this is about how do we balance that employer and research responsibilities how do we give specific support on the career development of researchers, quality and diversity agenda, and, and helping our researchers make the next step, make that transition to a more experienced role. And then finally, um, the European institutions involved in this review were very interested in the Cross and Pearl survey in terms of the useful information that could be um, gathered from doing these sorts of surveys with researchers and principal investigators on the ground. And certainly in the UK, we're very interested in benchmarking ourselves against other institutions in Europe to see how well we're doing. So I think there's a win-win situation here in terms of how can we use this very simple tool to, to move forward on this agenda. So thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions.